timbered hills of the Pacific Coast? What was it like here 70 years ago? What kind of world did they live in? Listen. Lumber, the cornerstone industry that brought about the western settlement of the Pacific Northwest. The wet climate of the region creates a lush, fast-growing forest like nowhere else in North America. The Pacific Northwest is logging country, and these hills have been alive with activity since the late 1800s. Although horse and oxen were utilized for a time, soon the choice for efficient, inexpensive power became the steam engine. Loggers were quick to adapt the steam engine for use in the forest. With their vertical boilers, steam-powered winches large and small appeared. Perhaps honoring the animals they replaced, they were soon known in the woods as donkeys. Life in the woods during those robust times is now easily romanticized. But it was dangerous and hard work serenaded by the simple, haunting melodies and punctuating rhythms of the steam engine. After the passing of the age of steam, the old-time logger remembered these sights, sounds, and aromas like a long-lost friend. Whatever transfusion happened in the woods, it seemed to become a part of their life's blood. It is not surprising that loggers also developed their own unique style of railroading. The harnessing of steam power for use on logging railroads led to a breed of locomotive rarely seen by the general public, the geared locomotive. There were three popular designs of this beast, the Heisler, the Shea, and the Climax. Back in the woods, tracks were built quickly over rough terrain with minimal grade preparation. Trestles were engineered and constructed on the spot. The loads were heavy, the rail rough, uneven, and not entirely stable. But the railroad quickly proved itself a fundamental component of the logging industry. With tracks weaving through the woods like webs of steel, many logging companies owned and operated their own railroads. Their names have taken on almost mythical status among rail historians. Fast, distinctive little rod engines help deliver loads from the hills and mills to the main lines. These were similar in basic design to mainline locomotives, although generally smaller. But the really tough work was reserved for the odd-looking, slow-moving, sure-footed geared locomotive. These were the engines that penetrated deep into the woods, working on the front line of the logging harvest. In the Northwest, they were all affectionately known as Lokis. To accommodate the rugged terrain of the Pacific Northwest, the loggers placed demands on the manufacturers to create more efficient locomotives. Naturally, the manufacturers responded with new models called the West Coast Special, 
and the Pacific Coast Shade. Geared locomotive technology was refined up into the 1930s. With the onset of the Great Depression, orders for new locomotives soon fell off. But the steam Loki continued to serve loggers for over 70 years before disappearing in the 1950s and early 1960s. Today, the public is discovering a particular fascination for old specialized railroad equipment, even to the point of constructing elaborate, miniature, live steam versions of the locomotives. In the age of the computer, this living, dynamic iron machinery seems both quaint and powerful, displaying a strangely hypnotic virility. Tucked away in the hills and mountains of North America, one can still find operating examples of this intriguing technology, all thanks to a handful of individuals and preservation organizations. Because of their efforts, these unique images, sounds, and aromas from the Age of Steam are sent echoing through the hills and forests again to capture the imagination of new generations. This is a celebration of one such organization and a celebration of the loggers' beloved Steam Loki, the wild iron horse of our industrial heritage. This man is a kind of a wizard, or at least many people think he is. He does practice a mechanical sorcery that is from another age, the age of steam. And he does seem almost a wizard, able to conjure up life from rusting pieces of iron. Although a soft-spoken man, under his guidance, he has efficiently repopulated a stableful of the wild iron horse. His knowledge of the steam locomotive could fill volumes. He is, in every sense of the word, a master mechanic. And his inborn connection to the steam locomotive runs very deep, something he himself can hardly explain. His name is Jack Anderson. Kind of been in love with 45 for a long time. My parents, when we went to the ocean when I was younger, we'd always stop in Hoquiam and they'd let me look at this thing behind the fence. And it's, uh, it's been a favorite for quite a while. It's gonna take a real going over to put her back in service. Parts of, the, parts of this machines are in pretty good condition. We'd like to get the skin off the boiler though and find out what that salt air in the harbor has done to the boiler shell. Here in Washington State, Near the shadow of one of North America's tallest peaks, a unique set of circumstances has come together, allowing this man's skills and talents to flourish. This is the Mount Rainier Scenic Railroad, a sanctuary for the once common steam logging locomotive that served extensively throughout North America. As the chief mechanical officer, Jack has been responsible for all locomotive restorations at Mount Rainier Scenic since its earliest days. That was the winter of 80-81. did it outside in Tacoma on the tide flats. We rebuilt the Heisler and the Climax down there. It was in a log yard where we did this rebuilding, which was kind of handy because the big log stackers were able to pick up just about anything we needed picked. And we had a, the shelter of a truck shop to put some of the smaller parts in where we could work on them. 
But come winter, it was pretty miserable sometimes working on this cold iron. We brought the Climax up with a lot of equipment from Tacoma up to the LB site. And she steamed poorly and had a couple other little problems. So we made modifications to the drafting and the stack and repaired a crosshead slipper that had been giving us trouble. And she was the mainstay locomotive for the first summer. Over the winter, we rebuilt Heisler, and then we would use Heisler and Climax interchangeably. And we ran with those two engines for a long time. Since the early years, Mount Rainier Scenic has benefited from an important affiliation. It's an offshoot or a growth of the Western Forest Industries Museum, which began as Camp 6, a logging museum in Point Defiance Park in Tacoma. Uh, they wanted to expand, and rather than expand within the park confines in Tacoma, they decided to move out here. It was good timing because Milwaukee was abandoning their track in the area and Weyerhaeuser was in a position to buy uh, this branch and another one. Uh, the other branch they used for logging is the Chehalis Western. But this particular branch, the Morton branch, has only been used uh, commercially by us with the steam trains. Operating a tourist line with two different styles of geared locomotives, the Climax number 10 and the Heisler number 91, was already putting the new Mount Rainier Scenic Railroad on the map. While several dozen Heislers have been restored, with many more preserved in static displays, number 10 is one of only three operating climaxes remaining in all of North America. Well, they were the cheapest, and I think a lot of the companies just wore them out, and then that, that was it. They were scrap as far as they were concerned, and justifiably. Uh, this engine's got a lot of welding on the truck frames where she's had to be reinforced. Jack's skill as chief mechanical officer was soon to benefit from an exciting endowment to Mount Rainier Scenic Railroad. Tom Murray, Jr., organizer of the Western Forest Industries Museum, set aside some land at his Murray Pacific Lumber Company facility near Mineral Lake for use by the railroad. Not only that, a locomotive shop would be constructed on the property. Our shop building was finally completed in 1985, and it's, it's been our, a godsend to us ever since. Uh, we've been able to equip it with some older but uh, large machine tools so that we can duplicate parts. Uh, we've, we haven't had to send out or have another machine shop build any parts for us for 10 or 12 years now, so uh, it's, it's been affordable to keep this stuff going when you can do it in-house. The new shop gave the locomotives a much needed home. By nature, the steam engine requires a lot of personal care, especially geared engines. They, they do take an awful lot more lubricant and attention. Uh, there's more parts that are moving and can get out of adjustment. They're, uh, slow machines. Sometimes it seems like you get a day or two of service out of them and then got to spend a day in the shop. But that's, that's geared engines for you. The new shop soon led to another exciting addition for the railroad. that we finally got a rod locomotive and that would be our Porter Mikado number five. And what a difference between gears and rod locomotives. Uh, she's down right now uh, to comply with the new FRA 15 year boiler rules. We're doing, putting a new smoke box and a boiler patch and new tubes in her and then uh, cleaning her up and taking care of any other little problems she's had. 
she's been our, our sweetheart locomotive for a long time. Looking at number five's old smoke box, we can see the emergency patch applied two years earlier during the hauling of the heavy rock trains. Mount Rainier Scenic likes to keep these locomotives on the move. In addition to preserving and rebuilding, the public is invited to see and ride the Mount Rainier Scenic in the form of regular excursion and dinner trains. On this railroad, you'll always find steam on the point. Yeah, I've, I've been underneath a locomotive at one or two o'clock in the morning fixing something so that we could make sure that she was running the next day, or I've had to come up to the shop and fire up a spare in the wee hours so that we could guarantee our steam program. Uh, we, we do guarantee that we have steam operating seven days a week during the summer. We finally have enough locomotives to where it's not as difficult to do that. Now, only days before an exciting railroad celebration, locomotives begin shakedown operations. And right here, in the old sort yard of the West Fork Logging Company, railroad history suddenly comes alive. This tank engine is one of Mount Rainier Scenic's more recent restorations. Right now we're operating the Hammond Lumber Company 17, an Alco-built uh, 282 tank engine, which is a husky little engine, lots of power, has a, has a good chug to her. She's a funny engine though, she's compact. Uh, water capacity is a big problem with only 2,000 gallons in her tank. She's also a little low on oil capacity with only a 1,000 gallon tank. That'll get us uh, three and a half, four days, depending on who's firing and running. <laughs> but she's, uh, we almost kid each other by saying she's a Japanese locomotive, uh, like a compact car. It's, it's hard to get into some places on 17 because she is such a compact design and everything's tucked in there together and uh, she's difficult to, to work on. If you've got a, a leaky pipe somewhere and you've got to go underneath to correct it, you've got to put her on a pit and crawl underneath her frame and just to get to it. And whereas number five has got an airy frame and she's more delicate and much easier to, to, to work around, yeah. Alco realized a popular design with this locomotive, and it could be found on a number of logging short lines. She rides on the 282 wheel configuration of a Mikado, but due to her size and tank engine status, she is often referred to as a minaret. That term, however, may more accurately apply to another class of tank engine, the Alco 2102, manufactured specially for the minarets in Western Railway. The confusion is because both types were to be found there. Switching operations have revealed another locomotive one could easily say 
is awaiting restoration. This is the running gear of the famous logging alley known as the Skookum, the only 2442 left in North America. She began life in Tennessee and ended her life with Deep River Logging here in Washington State when she rolled over on her side in a curve. The railroad decided that was enough. They were going to abandon operations. A rail fan then took her apart and moved her to a museum north of here towards Seattle, where she sat for 30 years. The running gear is in pretty good condition, having received a rebuild not too long before they uh, rolled her over and abandoned her. The firebox is in excellent condition. Um, we'd love to put her together. Our only constraint is time and money. Almost every steam locomotive that survives to this day carries with it some sort of unique history. Number 17's began with a twist of fate. She worked Hammond Lumber Company down in California, and there was a big fire back in the 40s which burned up the forest and burned up the bridges on the railroad. Unfortunately, 17 was on the far side of the bridges from the scrapyard. And Hammond couldn't see any sense in even putting temporary bridges back in just to haul 17 to the scrappers. So she was abandoned. Gus Peterson, a Klamath, California uh, logger, he went in there and took her apart and made a skid road and brought her out uh, behind a cat and put her together and operated it on his Klamath and Hopal Valley Railroad for a couple of years. Well, 17 and the big Shea 11 and our little display Heisler and Elby were purchased from Gus Peterson as a, as a group of locomotives back in the early 80s. Uh, they sat around here, the big Shea and the 17 sat around for quite a while. Four years ago we rebuilt the Shea and then three years ago we rebuilt 17. The Shea number 11 has been operating at Mount Rainier Scenic since 1994. She is a 90 ton, three truck, Pacific Coast type Shea built by Lyman in 1929. She is one of about 2,779 Shea locomotives built between 1880 and 1945. Her restoration gave Mount Rainier Scenic the ability to demonstrate the three most popular examples of geared engines, Shea, Heisler, and Climax. With over 2,500 locomotives produced, Lima's Shea was the most prominent geared locomotive design in the woods. In fact, the very same side shaft principle could be found in a Shea knockoff produced by Willamette Iron and Steel of Portland, Oregon. While Climax won the award for cheapest locomotive, one might pose the question as to which was the best. There's, there's room for debate about the other two breeds of geared locomotives, the Heisler and the Shea. Uh, 
more Shays were sold than any other geared locomotive, but of course, Lima started producing them much earlier than the Climax or the Heisler companies. Heisler's production run was from 1898 to 1941, and it actually produced the least number of the three types. As near as records can show, there were only 644 Heislers ever built. Uh, the Shay is a nice machine, uh, but the Heisler is more uh, more engineered. Uh, the German Mr. Heisler was uh, a, a very good and creative uh, mechanical engineer, and many features are built into her that uh, are far superior construction-wise than Lima put into the Shay. For instance, both the Pacific Coast Shea that we have and the West Coast Special Heisler were the top of the line at the times, uh, 1929, 1930, and the Heisler's got uh, cast components in her trucks and very few fasteners, whereas the Shea has got some cast components, but the trucks are built up of bar, channel, and rivets, and everything else. She's, she's got a lot of pieces that, that work themselves loose. The Heisler doesn't have this. Uh, the Heisler 90 degree V configuration on the engines uh, requires only two eccentrics for the Stevenson link valve motion to work both cylinders, whereas the Shea has got six pair of eccentrics to work her three cylinders with Stevenson link valve here. Heislers were a little weak in their frames. The, the Shays were a little weak construction-wise until the Pacific Coast Shea came out where the engines were actually mounted on, on the frame of the locomotive rather than being bolted onto the boiler, which had been previously done for years and years. Uh, that was a big step in the right direction. The Shea is a pretty smooth running locomotive. Uh, the bearings on the right side do take a beading, the journal bearings and the shaft bearings. Uh, they're fairly easy to get to. Uh, the shafts just slide right out. If you wanted to get to the wheels, you can't drop them like on a drop pit. You've got to disassemble the truck to put your wheels into a lathe to true them up. The Heisler and the Climax are far easier to unwheel. Those are some of the differences. Uh, I like the Heisler. Um, I don't know if I like her better than the Shea or not, but uh, Heister and Shea definitely have Climax licked. <laughs> Jack's quiet, upbeat manner inspires a growing legion of rail fan volunteers who contribute greatly to the operation of the railroad. In advance of any big event, one will often find a spontaneous crew of volunteers attacking what might best be described as an historic railroad experience in hard labor, working on a pick and shovel track gang. It's safe to say these nuts are really tight. These volunteers are an interesting collection of individuals from all walks of life sharing that common bond, a love of trains. This pretty much describes the Mount Rainier Scenic Railroad organization from top to bottom. It is a labor of love, but some of Mount Rainier Scenic's engineers have seen enough milepost markers to bring with them special qualifications. For 
all manner of steam engines back when we had them. I started out firing on the Alaska Railroad, and uh, then I came down and went to work on the Northern Pacific. That, of course, became the Burlington Northern, and then finally I retired from the VN in 94. Well, I worked on just about ever whatever type of steam engine we had, the W3, the Mikes, and the consolidated engines, and the switch engines, whatever, you know, whatever we were running. Behind the scenes, there is another individual who loves steam engines. In fact, he grew up around them, watching his father's West Fork Timber Company Railroad operating on some of the same track as the Mount Rainier Scenic. He is the founder of the Western Forest Industries Museum. His name is Tom Murray Jr. His enthusiasm for logging steam engines has found him spearheading the funding of all Mount Rainier Scenic's locomotive restorations. In addition to running his own Murray Pacific Corporation, he can occasionally be found keeping alive memories of the fascinating days of steam in the woods with his own collection of miniature live steam logging machinery. took a moment out of his busy schedule to reminisce about the days of logging railroads. And when it was snowy and frosty, of course, why, the crew would be going up in the morning and the engine crew and the brakeman riding in a cab and, and they hit a steep pitch and it was pretty frosty and all of a sudden why they lost traction and, and the trains just started to slide backwards down the hill and they all bailed out. all sitting there in a snowbank, weren't wondering where they're going to get another job after my father canned them for letting the train get away. And and uh, they waited, and all of a sudden, here they hear this chug, 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 and the train had slid back down the hill till the grade flattened out a little bit, where the wheels got a new bite on the rail, and here comes the train chugging up the hill, and as it came by, where it wasn't going more than three or four miles an hour, they all jumped back on board, and Went to work just like nothing had happened. Tom Murray Sr. was the founder of the West Fork Timber Company at Mineral and its logging railroad. In fact, Mount Rainier Scenic's Heisler carries a commemorative number. Built in 1930, this Heisler went to work in Oregon for the Kanzua Pine Mills. 102 was her number then, and she stayed at Kanzua until retirement in 1959. The number 91 pays homage to a similar West Fork Lumber Company Heisler that once traveled these same rails. Mount Rainier Scenic has not only restored steam locomotives from the Northwest, but has also collected a fine assortment of retired freight equipment as well. This will add exceptional authenticity to the look of this festival's demonstration of steam power. To even the most casual observer, this is rolling stock of a now quite rare vintage. Historic passenger cars also seem to find their way to Mount Rainier. The railroad, along with the Mount Rainier Dining Car Company, has been restoring several former Canadian Pacific coaches built in the early 1950s. Steam locomotive dinner trains are regularly scheduled out of Elby. Another exciting acquisition is this former Reading Railroad observation car, built in the 1920s. In 1976, 
it carried dignitaries and presidents as the last car on America's bicentennial freedom train. The concept of a five steam locomotive event has been a rumored dream of Mount Rainier Scenics for years. Where else could this kind of historical railroad presentation be made? The announcement of this event sent ripples of excitement throughout the rail fan community. But for Mount Rainier Scenic, meeting new demands of track and rolling stock repairs has taken more time than anticipated. The Porter Mikado rebuild slipped behind schedule. Rather than rush to put number five back together, Jack called on an old friend who had just what was needed to fill the bill. Jack's old partner, Harold Borovec, operates a beautiful 90-ton Mikado, number 15, out of Chehalis, Washington, for the Chehalis and Centralia Railroad Association. Harold understands just what it takes to put on an event of this nature. I must be just a little bit crazy to be here. I'm 71 years old. I should be uh, doing something else. But I went to work for this railroad when I was 16. I was checking yard. I was a yard checker. And I worked in the shop uh, on Saturdays or whenever I wasn't busy elsewhere. So I was born here in 1927, a year before the engine came here. It's kind of uh, unique that uh, the locomotive and I kind of survived together. Yeah. And uh, we're spending our retirement years together. So, uh, so I, uh, I, I count that as a blessing. But from Chehalis to Elby is over 85 miles. The little used track is restricted to 10 miles per hour. Would Harold feel up to the trip? No need to ask twice. The five locomotive celebration was set. enjoyed by the devoted rail fan is hard to describe as he pursues a fascination with trains. Mount Rainier Scenic Railroad is one of the few places in North America where such a wide variety of steam locomotives can be seen operating in their natural habitat. This festival presents a rare opportunity for one and all to experience and personally photograph dynamic railroad images that have otherwise slipped into history. The morning of the big event arrives and although the sun is delaying in appearance, the photographers simply switch to the appropriate film type and begin firing away. For the first part of the event, the two rod engines will take the heavy passenger train on a little five-mile excursion to the siding at New Reliance. They will have to tackle several grades, some up to 1.5 percent. Number 15 is no stranger to Mount Rainier Scenic. Jack, Harold, and a support team rebuilt her up at the mineral shop with a Class 5 overhaul in 1989. 
as this weekend is her first run of the season, little problems do crop up. Harold noted to Jack that her Sanders had quit working. Sanders dump a small stream of sand on the rails right in front of the drivers to increase traction when the rails get slippery. It seemed no amount of subtle persuasion could get them going. But there's no time to worry about that now. It's time to highball out of Elby. Besides, Harold has an old railroader's trick up his sleeve. Hang on, we're not even at the steepest part of the grade yet.
Hustlers, the two rod engines have finally conquered the grave. At the same time, things back in Mineral Yard are a bit more peaceful as the three geared engines are ready to leave for the morning run. Meanwhile, the train has reached New Reliance. The locomotives are running around to the other end of the train for the return trip to Elby.
Drifting downhill into Elby, the train is greeted by the three geared engines. They are quickly coupled ahead of the rod engines. The Shea number 11 will lead this posse. With five locomotives on the head end, this is Mount Rainier Scenic's very first quintuple header. With number 11 on the point, we travel east toward Park Junction and the Nisqually River Bridge. Looking over the cab of number 15 is an incredibly rare experience.
green passenger cars are Pullman commuter coaches that served up and down the West Coast on the Southern Pacific Railroad. They spent some of their retirement years at the old Oregon, Pacific, and Eastern at Cottage Grove. They were featured in a rail fan motion picture favorite, Emperor of the North. A photographer's rail fan special is an event that may appear rather odd to the uninitiated. In addition to riding the train, participants are dropped off at various points along the line. The train backs up and then goes charging past at full power, blowing whistles and making more smoke than is usually ever really necessary. Every photographer waits for just the right moment and then cranks off as many good shots as he can. Everyone quickly piles back onto the train to move down the line and probably do it all again. However, the casual observer needs to be aware. Once you catch a whiff of that locomotive smoke, it's hard not to become intoxicated with rail fan fever. train buff hasn't dreamed of packing up their cameras and somehow time traveling back to the 1930s or 40s for a day of serious rail fanning. We have taken the liberty of piecing together scenes from multiple locations to try and recreate just such an event. With several lumber companies and other operations in this neck of the woods, the following train activity could easily have occurred on this very same branch back in the days of the old Milwaukee Road.
steam engines. Steam engines was always my love. I uh, I never got enough of them. I never never ran enough of them. Never fired enough of them when I was working. I uh, I can't tell you what the fascination is. My very earliest memories. When I was a young kid. My dad used to take me on the helper engines, and I'd ride up on his lap, firing the old valleys, running them. Going to Portland with him during that I hired out when I was only 16 years old. I was lied, lied about my age and went to work. Of course, I suppose it helped that my uncle was the master mechanic, but uh, When I was uh, little, even before I went to school, uh, this engine caught my eye, and I could see this locomotive down in the valley uh, from our, our house. I could tell them apart by their whistles. I'd have to climb up in an apple tree or something to see them, but uh, anyway, uh, uh, this one was my favorite, and uh, I followed it around like a puppy dog. I moved my bicycle and followed it around town. It used to do quite a bit of switching here in Chehalis. I saw it as a kid. We, I grew up in Stillicum for the first uh, five years of my life. And, uh, right across the street was an embankment and the Northern Pacific Main Line. And we're still, still running steam locomotives there for a few years, and I was mesmerized by them. Uh, when, uh, when we moved out of Stillicum, we moved uh, closer to Tacoma and still had the vantage point of looking over the Main Line. And all I, I could hear the locomotives whistling for the crossing about a mile away. And I'd hear a diesel horn, and a diesel horn, and a diesel horn. And one, one day I heard steam again and uh, ran over to the, to the bank and looked out. And that was the last steam engine that Northern Pacific ran. It was the 1776, uh, a nice Mikado. And that was all. So <laughs> I've had this love affair with steam ever since. Father, uh, he worked for many years up on the Northern Pacific. Dad and granddad both. He hired out for Jim Hill in St. Paul, and he was one of Jim Hill's construction engineers. He worked all the way across the country, and then he settled in Delta, Everett, and he retired there in, what, 1935, I think it was, on the old Jim Hill pension. My dad went to work the first day of January of 1910. And I went to work the 10th day of September of 42. And 
My son went to work the 18th of May of 74, so we've got a fair <laughs> amount of seniority built up over the years. It became a lot of fun. After a while, I, I think I would have paid the Northern Pacific to work over there. Uh, I worked uh, almost every weekend while I was going to school. I could get in five days on a weekend if I really worked at it hard, uh, mm -hmm. including uh, with time and a half. You see. Oh, sure. So uh, I, was, I was making pretty good money, uh, uh, 56 cents an hour. Man, that was great. And 59 when you work nights. Uh, so uh, I bought a lot of uh, savings bonds during the war. And, and that's what my wife and I got married on. And, I mean, we used that, used those saving bonds for our nest egg. And all thanks to the Northern Pacific and the Calus Chehalis and Cascade. Although not well known, Mount Rainier Scenic has a fine collection of vintage diesel power as well. As a bonus for the rail fans, a classic F9 makes an exciting appearance in her original Northern Pacific freight engine colors. Diesels are funny. Which is cheaper to operate? A diesel locomotive, an old one, all our engines are 50 years old or older, except for the F9, she was built in 56. Uh, when a part on a diesel locomotive fails, you either need to have a pretty good parts supply or a derelict locomotive to rob from, or you spend big money locating the part somewhere in the United States. When a part on a steam locomotive breaks down, you shrug your shoulders and you go to work in the machine shop and, and carve one out of brass or iron and put it on. Uh, the, the expense of repairing a diesel can be more expensive than repairing a steam locomotive. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a toss up there. This will be the last appearance of number 10 and number 91 for some time. They are both due for the FRA's new 15-year boiler work. It's a big job, especially for a geared locomotive when you're only going to use it a few days a year. It's a real big investment. With a growing collection of historically significant equipment, Mount Rainier Scenic is still a young, vital, and important organization with enormous potential. Yeah, that's 
This is Skookum's boiler, uh, the, the first logging Mallee built a 2442. Uh, I'm afraid we have four, four locomotives. Skookum here, number 70, a Rainier Mikado is sitting on the ground in pieces over there. Number three, a little 24 ton standard gauge Shea is sitting in a couple piles over there. Heisler number 10 is the first successful three truck Heisler ever built. We just purchased two more of them that are on display closer to Mount Rainier National Park, a couple of two truck locomotives. So we're the valley of the Heislers around here, like it or not. And then 45, our, our newest entrant, is uh, those are all awaiting restoration, uh, which simply means money and time. As to what locomotive will be restored next, only time will tell. But we can be sure of one thing. Like all restoration from Mount Rainier Scenic Railroad, it will be really something to see. This is a dream come true, really. I've always wanted to operate steam locomotives, and what better place to do it than here? It's, a, it's an operator error, uh, but it's my job to repair. <laughs> <laughs> Be sure to enjoy the companion video to steam up at Mount Rainier, The Rock Trains. Golden Rail Video is pleased to present another in its unique line of highly praised railroad videos, The Rock Trains. This is one of the most incredible steam events of modern times. Two steam locomotives, a porter-built logging mic, and a geared Climax locomotive battle heavy loads and steep grades to deliver rock and gravel to the site of a bridge washout. This is not old footage, but a contemporary emergency revenue freight operation captured as it happened with digitally mastered stereophonic sound. See just what it took to run the daily steam freight trains on the old short lines of North America. It beats you absolutely to death. You'll be there in the dead of night as the train crews start the day. You'll be trackside as the locomotives struggle on slippery rail. You'll see the trains span dramatic canyons and bridges to deliver the loads on time.
The Rock Train features one of the rarest cab rides ever caught on video, and one you'll never forget in the notoriously cantankerous Climax locomotive, one of the last still operating in the world. All the action is shot against the splendor of the beautiful Pacific Northwest scenery. If you ever wondered what it was like working on a steam railroad short line, don't miss this once-in-a-lifetime railroad adventure, The Rock Trains, only from Golden Rail Video. This is really a, a body-hurting experience. Before the days of laser technology, before computer-controlled machinery, precision, and maximum productivity was based on having a keen eye, which also helped keep you alive. This is the story of a survivor from another time, a specimen of industrial archaeology known as the steam power sawmill. Golden Rail Video presents a fascinating and one-of-a-kind video adventure. From the coastal mountain range of Oregon comes the story of a sawmill that time forgot. North America's last commercial mill still powered by steam engines. This is a truly unique and highly entertaining video. You'll learn how this mill survived see how it competes in the modern world of logging and wood products. You'll meet the men who daily work with equipment usually found in museums. They are the inheritors of steam-powered technical know-how, now all but extinct. And of all the machinery we have in the mill, we have less trouble with that steam engine than anything else. You'll learn how science is changing this industry, renewing our forest in ways unknown only a few years ago. And you'll ride the hundred-year-old rail line that still services the mill, featuring this classic diesel locomotive. This top-quality video will take you to a world you may have never seen, giving you a close-up look at all the rough and tumble energy of this ancient equipment in full operation. Step out of the world of high-tech and into the fascinating world of steam power with Golden Rail Video's Steam Power Sawmill. Available at finer hobby stores, industrial museums, or direct by mail or phone. From the high desert of northern Arizona comes the story of a unique historic railroad. A railroad that helped build the most famous national park in the entire world. Golden Rail Video is proud to present Thunder Under Heaven, the complete story of the Grand Canyon Railway. Another in Golden Rail's premium line of railroad video adventures Thunder Under Heaven presents the inside story of this beautifully restored railway. 
you'll see the heritage and the history of this former Santa Fe Railroad brought back to life. You'll take a first-class seat on a ride through a slice of the American West. See why these old rails embrace the spirit of the Old West and never let go. All the locomotives are featured from the Alco Consolidations numbered 18 and 29 to the beautifully restored Baldwin Mikado number 4960. Featuring rare and beautiful footage gathered over five years. Meet the engineers, the Hostler crews, and the famous Grand Canyon Railway Cowboys. Take a cab ride in a rare first generation Alco passenger diesel. Join the fireman and engineer on 4960 as she thunders her way up to the Grand Canyon. Presented in carefully recorded and digitally mastered audio file sound. Don't miss this premium video adventure, Thunder Under Heaven, the complete story of the Grand Canyon Railway from Golden Rail Video. For the hardcore rail fan, Thunder Under Heaven is available in the special two-volume expanded edition featuring more detail on the locomotives and the shop, a tour through the Alco Diesel engine compartment and expanded cab rides, including the complete 4960 over-the-cab footage of the charge up the apex grade and through Coconino Canyon. If you can't get enough railroad action, the two-volume set is specially for you. Thunder Under Heaven, a premium video production from Golden Rail Video.